Hey, it's MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you're well and welcome to another Strategy Roundtable where we help you navigate this upcoming round of AFL Fantasy and all the big decisions, the players, the strategies that are going to help you into this round. We want to help you through it. Joining me on this episode as he has right throughout the season proper and the pre-season, it's pretty much a regular part of what we do every single week. It's Mini Mug. Hello, mate. How are you? Yeah, I'm not going too badly. How about yourself? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And also, uh, back on the pod for his first time in season. In the 50s, relevant. You heard a bunch of times. Couldn't today longer. Sneak him back in on the podcast. Jordox, how are you, mate? I'm good, mate. Good to see you, boys. Really excited to have a chat about the fantasy season so far. Mm. Uh, there is a lot of stuff that, lads, we want to cover this ground on this episode. Back into best 18. So no magpies, no response. Arguably, week we're learning a lot about team structures and their trade movements over these past couple of weeks. So really interested to see how our team shape up. But maybe we'll start with you. Last week, we talked a lot on this episode with uh, both yourself and all so, Ruth, we addressed um, whether or not it's And based on people's trades last week, we're seeing Darcy Wilson Ali Reid moving out. Um, Lazaro, I can kind of understand with him not being kind of available to yeah. play, uh, given that he was dropped. But <laughs> we saw these guys that traditionally we would think still had fifty to 100,000 potentially still in their head. And we Put kids to get into players like a Sam Flanders, a D'Ambrosio, and a bunch of other options through there. Uh, did you think that it's a sweeping statement, which are always fun to make generalized sweeping statements? Do you think we made some mistakes as a community if we if we forced and pushed trades and have lost some cash generation as a result of that? Was it upgrade season last week, knowing that really this week we're probably in the more traditional landscape of upgrade season? I, I think this week is, is probably where I would define as being the start of upgrade season for this season. I think last week you could have forced an upgrade. I think there was a lot of different ways that coaches were looking to do that. It was a lot of coaches were jumping off of failed mid-prices or who they considered to be failed mid-prices, you know, the likes of... Uh, Nat Fife was being jumped off by people. James Jordan, some people went off a little bit early. But some people were also trying to jump onto premiums that probably hadn't come down as far as what they'd hoped for or were jumping off of rookies that hadn't had the time to really mature and really get up to their fattened state. Um, you know, you mentioned the likes of Darcy Wilson, Harley Reid. I think that both of these cows are, you know, when they're in their best 22, they always have the potential to pop a spike score. And neither of these guys had. Um, that doesn't mean that they were always going to. And I don't think you can say that it was a failure to jump off of them early if you were happy with the trade that you got on the back end of it. Um, but it might hurt you in the long run to do so. You might have gotten an additional 30 or 40 points this week over the rest of the crowd, given that it was best 22 and you might have had a better rookie on field as a result of it, or you might have a better premium on field. But to say that that's going to be beneficial, well, it's really going to depend on the long run because you might have lost 100, 150 Ks worth of cash generation out of a Darcy Wilson or a Harley Reid, really depending on the cash count that he got into. Like if you went on to a Clohessy this week, uh, then it was a massive game. But if you moved on to a Harvey Thomas, that's basically a dead cow now at this point. Yeah, it's true. You bring him up and Jordox, I think you traded into Sam this week too, just gone in AFL fantasy. So routing that rookie gauntlet, which can often be the case. We haven't really seen side of them and you've banked a really nice score and, and one less issue for you and your specific team to trade into. But it, it feels simplistic to always say this is the number one priority for people. But gosh, you got to have some unique components, Jordox, to your side this week to be fading on Sam, don't you? Oh, he's decided. Oh, I think you're on mute there, buddy. He muted himself. Our first for yeah, the season. Yeah. Your first for the season. <laughs> oh, well, that was always going to happen, wasn't it, fellas? Um, yes, no, I did. I did jump on the close here this week. And, and you know, Minnie was saying before, the difference between, you know, grabbing a closey versus uh, Harvey Tho Thomas, you know, it's a flip of a coin type of stuff. Um this week, you know, you've got Closey, obviously, but you've also got Graham as well down there. So I, 
I think, yeah, he's going to be pretty popular. Going back to sort of the the discussion around when to do your up, when does upgrade season start? You know, last week did we maybe jump a bit early on a couple of those guys that are coming down in value? As someone who's who's come from the background of the the more um, trade limited formats of mm-hmm. fantasy, um, it's something I've had to really get my head around with AF is that you know all those old traditional ideals of, of you got to wait for that that primo to bottom out before you jump or wait till a, a certain player is at the absolute worst possible break even before jumping. You know, AF, it's more of a balance. And last week you might have jumped off a guy and jumped onto one of those primos and, you know, you could have got him cheaper in a few weeks. But that that's the trick of AF. You've got those two trades every week and you have to use them. Yeah, it's true. It's an interesting one. People you mentioned, they're looking at Will Graham as a downgrade option this week. So we've got a pair of sons that just based on how they performed in the weekend gone, I have zero concerns about their job security and the side. They might not score what they did over the next couple of weeks like that again, but they're going to get a good three to four week hit at it. So absolutely no concerns there. Probably the other option, people, they will talk about the swans that are departing in a moment and who we should prioritise. The other one's probably Charlie Combin. Now, if we're talking super coach, it's probably a different conversation. We'll do that uh, in 24 hours' time. But Mini Monk, he's not, again, going to 107 every single week. We'd love it if he does. But what's your takes? Under 400K, we're probably not desperate for a rookie downgrade just yet. But is, where would you see him in the priority of these three sub-400 downgrade options? I think that Klaus is the clear number one. And, I mean, the trade-in numbers for him are just showing it. It's Every man and his dog who doesn't own him is getting him this week. He's been traded in by 27,000 coaches at the time of recording, and I expect by the time that round one, or the round starts, rather, that will probably be closer to 50,000. I, I would be shocked if it's not that high. Um, but... Deciding between Graham and uh, and Combin is a bit of a trickier one, actually. Um, I think that Combin is not the type of player you want to pay over 400000 for. So if you're going for him, you're probably going this week. And I think he might give those coaches that tried to go a little bit early into maybe what we might think is being a little bit early into upgrade season. If they went a week early on, you know, bringing in a Flanders or a Zorka or upgrading elsewhere, Maybe they can actually go a classy and a combin, fix a couple of red dots or fix a failed mid prices in a red dot and be able to, you know, just say, I'll hold water for this week. I'll get two players that have negative break evens. I'll make that money back up a little bit. And then I'll kickstart in with the kitty that I can bank over for next week as well. That's probably the route that I'd take there. Uh, and I think that if we see it again from Graham, we see another 60 on the weekend, we see his high CBA rate like he did, you know, on the past weekend. I'd have no issues trading into him about 300k next week either. Well, and that's what you really, mentioned is he's available, isn't he? Com- yeah. Combin's a really tricky one because nearly 400k for a cash cow, mm. even with that break even. And I'm not embarrassed to admit that when I saw that score on the weekend, I thought, hold on, who is Charlie Combin? I had a bit of a look today. <laughs> and so it's his fourth year on the list. So he's not, yeah. you know, a, a baby in, in that respect. Hasn't played many games, but I noticed last year he did score an 80 and a 77 along with some utter trash scores. So the guy can take a mark. Now, I'm pretty sure he was playing forward last year and this mm, role correct. he finds himself is in the back line. And, you know, it's it's not the first year we've said the north back line is a good spot to sit if you're trying to get fantasy points. The last few years tell us that. So if Clarko perseveres with him in that spot, um, I, I think what Minnie said was spot on. You don't want to pay over 400. So it's the balance between I want to have another look at him because yeah. where did that 107 come from versus, nah, he's too expensive to wait. Yeah. yeah I think it's a really it's tricky one. balance. I mean, we look at someone like Ben McKay, who was basically playing as that key defender for North Melbourne last year. And, you know, I think this was Rowan who actually threw this stat at me. His ceiling score was in the 90s in the years that he's been playing at North Melbourne. And Combin's gone and pulled a 107 out of the hat. And, you know, yes, that North Melbourne defence is getting battered. Yes, there's a lot of points to be had down there, but it's not normally for the key tools. It's normally for the smalls that are doing the distributing job. So he had a very good game on the weekend. He was 
really, really good to watch. But I can't help but think that maybe the narrower ground helps someone who can actually read the flight of the ball. I mean, you've got a very small area that you can come into from the forward, into the forward 50 if you're attacking it um, at Norwood Oval. And perhaps that really suited him to be able to get a lot, a lot of intercepts. And on a bigger ground with a bit more space, there's a bit more area. And someone who isn't, you know, nearly two metres tall and a great reader of the ball doesn't get 11, you know, intercept marks on his day. Maybe it's only three or four and that's a 50 or a 60. I guess the yeah. question is, it, that, you know, does it matter if he, it, it depends on whether he's on your field or not. So if he's on your field, yeah, geez, he could drop a 30 or a 40 on your head and, you know, yeah. we couldn't be too surprised by it. But it's the beauty is we've got the best three teams. Yeah, yeah correct. Ah, so that's everyone. exactly it. Very protected. So very, I, very, very I think protected. That, I think that that does kind of hide a little bit, but it could just be like Harvey Thomas. Like we saw Harvey Thomas went 100-odd two weeks ago. And then he comes out <laughs> yeah, this week and goes 15. That's a cautionary and tale. <laughs> right. There. I would not be shocked if we saw Common come out and get like a 30 or a 40. And then his cash gen is really stunted. Especially if you miss someone like uh if you if you're going him over a class, yeah, I would advise you to kind of think on it again. But let's say you go him over a Graham. Well, at least Graham's got the DPP, at least he's mm. got a similar break even. Uh, and at least he's much cheaper, you're not forking out nearly 400 k for him. Yeah, it's true. So we talk about being in best 18. It's because we're seeing two teams not available to play for us this week. It's Collingwood and Sydney. Politely, the Collingwood player of relevance is Nick Dacos. And I do want to have a conversation about him in terms of those that we have owned to this point. I do want to talk about the plan of how we get him. But really, it's the Sydney players that have been of most relevant to us at this time. Mm. The question we've got to ask is about five players that are swans that have been in our sides really quickly we're going to work our way through a couple of them because i think they're pretty easy decisions and then there's one i want to stop and take a little bit more time on is there a world anyone would be considering trading nick dacos at almost 950k probably one of the top scorers we've got for the year is there a world Heaney, no didn't think so. yeah yeah no one's trading Heaney. <laughs> no of course jogging on um no. What about a Matty Roberts at 555,000? Still got a very attainable break even. Will pick up defensive status in a fortnight's time. Any takers to trade out Matthew Roberts just yet? Didn't think nah. so. Uh, that was quick and easy. This one's also quick and easy, but for probably the opposite reason, James Jordan, over 550,000. Um, break even of 66, so attainable based on his break even but uh, certainly hasn't quite delivered what we'd hoped. Still made plenty of money for us over the past four weeks. Plenty probably a touch generous to young JJ. Uh, anyone got a reason that they would strongly suggest holding James or is it, nah, he's done his job. Jog on, Jimmy. Oh, only if you've got two bigger issues to sort in your team. And I don't think that there would be many teams that have two bigger issues than what James Jordan is for this week. And when you say bigger issues, define what that means for me, because sometimes we can make mountains out of molehills and we can turn mountains into molehills in our fantasy sites. I think that in my mind, if you've got two rookies that are like at the 400K marker and they're both stored in cash and they're both not playing, you can't see them coming into their teams anytime soon. Maybe I would prioritize them over James Jordan, but I honestly think that he becomes one of the biggest issues to trade out this week because not only is he not making cash, he's sitting in your forward spot, he's a mid pricer, he's done his job. No, he's on the buy this week. Just just get rid of him. Like it, I would I would struggle to think of a team that wouldn't be in a good position, wouldn't be in a position where getting rid of him is the right move. Yep. I think that's a fair shout too. No, I can Let's see talk it. about uh I want to talk Nick Dacos. I'm deliberately putting Brody Grundy back just for a minute. Nick Dacos, yep. he's dropped a give or take about $80,000 off his starting mm. price. He's not available to us. Average of 98.2 is, I would say, probably a win for those that faded Nick. Um, there was probably really only one game in round one where you were nervous about it the whole time, but pretty much since that mm. point on, you felt relatively comfortable knowing that he wasn't surging into the seven-figure mark. The match against St Kilda sealed that. And, and I thought, relatively speaking, the game we were all concerned about for 
those that owned him, here comes a stinker. Those that faded him, here's what I'm banking on. It was probably on the side of those that went him. It, it kind of went their way. So really it's a St Kilda matchup where I think he got like a 61. That's pretty much defined where the faders feel content with the decision that they've made. Uh, Jordox, give me a, from the position of someone that faded Nick, what's your thoughts about that? And then, Minnie, I'll almost throw the other side of it to you for those half of the community, because it pretty much is a 50-50 split in the community about who started and who faded. For someone that's faded him, how urgent a priority is getting Nick Dacos into your side now, Jordox? Because you've, quote, unquote, won how your gamble or gambit had went. Now, what are you going to do over these next seven days to plan and prepare to get him into your side and how quickly? Yeah, it's definitely a tick for the faders. Um, in reality, I actually started him, so I'm trying to think the opposite of what I would <laughs> be thinking this week. I, look, I don't think he's, you know, urgent, urgent. Um, the, and the break even gives us that. So obviously he's got the week off this week. Next week he can, Yeah, this yeah, like that's right. Yeah. So... He could have a monster and still drop a bit of coin. So that's a minimum of two weeks, two rounds before a non-owner would need to find a way to get there. And then I reckon with someone like Dacos, as good as he is, I think he could play the break-even game. There may be a week where his break-evens, you know, are still over 100, but that's the right time for your side. You know, that's when you've culled a couple of cows, you've got a guy ready to upgrade. I just don't think it's um, an urgent thing at this point. We've seen already the start to this year that Collingwood's had hasn't quite been what it was last year. I think they're still working out a few things. And, you know, we've seen Dacos go back, see him go into the middle. I reckon there's been times where they've probably put him forward. We know how good the guy is. He's going to score wherever he is. But if you don't have him... There's probably a lot of other things that you could prioritise ahead of it. And I think that's an interesting point for us, Mini Monk, to get to because, yes, he's on the buy in Port Adelaide. So this was the three-week block that coaches were comfortable to go against Nick Dacos just based on legacy of information we knew heading into the preseason and season proper. But then after that, it's Essendon, an awesome matchup, Carlton potentially tricky, um, and then West Coast, Adelaide, Fremantle, Melbourne, North Melbourne, and then the next buy. So my goodness me, there are some teams that a, a firing Nick Dacos could absolutely put a stretch of 120-plus things on our head for us. For those that started him, what's your take, Mini Monk? You've lost about $80,000, which isn't ideal, but it's certainly not a, a season-defining loss move, is it? No, it's definitely not. And you're probably just saying, I've got myself a top six defender, probably a top three defender between now and the rest of the year that I don't have to trade into now. And I think the other thing you've saw is you have is you have around 15 by defender already. And there are not many teams that have one of those. We look at the six teams that are on the buy that round. Adelaide, don't see a defender being a premium there. Uh, Collingwood, just ACOS. Hawthorne, maybe Sicily comes around. Maybe he's a top six, but at this stage, it's not looking likely. Richmond, short, not looking likely at this stage. St. Kilda, maybe Nazire, maybe um, uh, Sinclair. Sinclair. You could yep. probably pick one of those and have one of those around 15 defender. And the dog is, there's nothing. So realistically, you've got one out of the probably three defenders on the round 15 buy already tucked away, screwed away. You don't have to trade into them. You're in a great spot. Like, if you've yep. been able to hold Nick Dacos through, you get through between now and to the end of the buys, um, sorry, the end of the mid-season buys, you've got him locked away, and you can focus on going for other upgrades. Like, you can take yeah. your pick of whichever midfield or whichever forward you want to go for now. So you might have taken a bit of a pain over the first four weeks so far, but, you know, it is what it is. You're out the back end. Enjoy the ride from now on. Yeah. My advice for someone that's uh, not owning Nick Dacos is your gamble has won so far. Don't mm. keep loading that dice for too long. <laughs> he is too Don't good keep putting it all on board. red. No. You've got to put it on no, black like, at some point or black absolutely. and white at some point. <laughs> if you're winning at the table and you've done what you said you would do, 
get away Passion. from that risk as quick as you can. Yeah. And I think Jordox has said, you know what? You can run that break-even game for another week. Port Adelaide's a tough matchup. But then after that, I wouldn't want to be pushing it to a third and a fourth week as a, yeah, I'll get him in four weeks' time. For me, it's yeah. get it on the early side of coming off the buy. Otherwise, the money you've saved could be very quickly undone with Nick Dacos. He can yeah. put a 50-point quarter out very, what do very we, easily. What do we think, though, for the argument, Dacos, to start or to fade? I, I think it's win-win. I reckon both sides of the argument would be pretty content with where things are and, I, and, I, and how his scoring went. I think non-owners are probably a bit happier at this stage. Uh, I, I think that that's that. signified by his ownership at higher ranks at the moment. But I think that non-owners need to jump on at some point, probably in the three weeks after his buy, maybe four weeks after, depending on when he mins out. If he's at nine sub 900K after the Port Adelaide game and you can get him at round seven at, you know, 880, 890K, you've almost got to make that jump. Like I we talked just before about forcing upgrades. Yeah, That's an upgrade that I'd almost be happy to force. You can cull whatever mid-pricer that's maxed out or whatever cow that you can if you can get onto that guy, because there is a chance that he goes 120 for those eight weeks. And if you can get a guy that can go 120s for eight weeks straight at a sub 900K price, you take that every day of the week. Yeah, I wouldn't be going any deeper than the round nine matchup against West Coast. If you no. do not have him by that period of time, because Collingwood will need the percentage boost, they will be putting their foot on the throat of the Eagles in that match. If you are running the gauntlet much deeper than that, regardless of the break even, whoo, my goodness me, um, it, it could be a bit crazy and messy for you. We want to get back to Grundy in a second as the last player off the buy, but just a little sneaky one for you. Mini Monks shouted it out on a podcast for us a couple of weeks ago. Just want to leave this one for you there. If you're watching this on YouTube, A, thank you. Welcome. Nice to see you. I hope you mm. subscribe to the channel. Um, but the break even of 61 He's under 700K, and he's a guy that has shown he's got a history of 90-plus average and can do what he did last weekend, which is big, big tons. Yeah, you want to find a way to get a cash cow off the ground and maybe still make some money and bank some points? Just saying, just putting it out there that he could be an option for you maybe after the Port Adelaide. Uh, I, and I will so just say... Jordan to go sub by he's getting a lot of CBAs, but when he's not in the CBAs, he pushes forward. Now, if you had a DFS, you look at their season long ticker and you look at general forwards, you'll see that Port Adelaide, Essendon, Carlton, and West Coast, three of them are dark green and one of them is light green. 660K, it's a tempter. It's more than a tempter, mini mug, that's for sure. Let's talk about the rucks. For us a little bit. It's been a fascinating line. Um, mm. If Max Gorn hadn't done what he did in opening round, I would suspect his ownership would have been even higher. Had Brody Grunder not done what he did in opening round, I suspect based on his preseason, his ownership would have been a lot lower. And thank goodness Tristan Cherry has done exactly what we forecasted and projected him to do. While Marshall and English have been around the ballpark of what I think owners would have hoped for. English a little sub over the past fortnight, but really, if in totality, we're feeling pretty happy about what it's kind of looked like. But Brody Grundy now presents us this interesting spot. Um, Ooh, an average of 91 is not bad. It's not as great as I think we all were hoping for. We were probably all expecting a high 90s to 100 probably closer to that 800,000 marker at this point in time of the season, but yet still has a pretty attainable break even and, and a fixture that's not horrible either. No. After the buys. No. But, but talk me through Grundy and the other ruck options that we now have. Do we have to move him on now or are there other options we can look at? You don't have to move him on now. And I think this is the biggest thing I'd say is that you. a lot of people would have said, I want to try and play 22 for every week of the best 18 that you can. And whilst that's a good aim to have, playing 21 this week isn't going to cost you a huge amount. It's 30, 40 points. He's averaging 90. You get a 60 rookie on. It's whatever. 
the run after the buy isn't dreadful. It's not great. It's Gold Coast, Hawthorne, GWS, Fremantle, Carlton. Four out of those five are quite restrictive. GWS is hmm. probably the friendliest of those five. We've seen that he has done poorly in a very restrictive matchup against Collingwood, but the others he's done okay and averaged around the 90 mark. But if you are looking to jump off, that's where the interest comes because there are quite a few teams that have Ruckman that are either down or coming down in price who have good Ruck uh, matchups over the next few weeks. And I, and I want to quickly just go to the trade-in statistics for AFA Fantasy because I think that it helps escape the pitch. If we look at Grundy traders out, there's 6,200 people that are currently trading Grundy out. And you go, right, well, that's not a massive amount. It's not small. It's not large. No. I think he's about the fourth or fifth most traded out for the week. Makes sense. But if we look who's being traded in, the number one trade-in currently is Tristan Cherry. And right. that makes you $2,000, which to me, Cherry's done really well this year. He's averaged 103. But how much longer do you think he can go for? Four, maybe five more weeks until he's probably done his job? It's maybe pushing the tan on the line. So either you're going right down or down to a mid-pricer who's on the way back up, in which case I think that there's probably two options you're going to, or you're going up. And I think that there's three options that people are considering, but there's really only two options that they should be considering. This week. Yeah. This week. So if we're going yeah. down, we've got mm -hmm. Lloyd Meek and Tom DeConey. Mm -hmm. I think Meek's the one that's interesting a lot of people because he's been playing pretty well the last couple of weeks. He seems to have that number one rock mantle sorted at Hawthorne. We don't know exactly how that's going to play out. It's really playing the gauntlet if you go to him. Mm -hmm. And if we look at his run, Hawthorne have Gold Coast this week, Jared Witts, pretty restrictive, North Melbourne the week after, Sydney the week after that, and then the Dogs and then St. Kilda. So it's middle of the road. It's not too bad. Tom DeConing has Adelaide and GWS. People have kind of slept on him under the radar a little bit. I'm not sure that I would go to him. I think I would favor Meek out of the two just because of the price. And I think that that's where the crowd tends to go as well. But the upgrade ones are interesting. And I'll start with the one that I don't think I would trade into. I think trading into, well, I think at two of them, I think trading into either Cherry or Gorn this week is a mistake. Hmm. I think Cherry is too late. You need to find somewhere else to go. You need to find some way to make up on the crowd. And I think the similar with Gorn, except for the fact that Gorn also has the buy next week. Yeah. And that yeah. is just, he's had a really good run. He's scored really well, but his ruck one coming up after this week and after his buy isn't nearly as appetizing. So he's got Brisbane this week. He's got Richmond the week after, Geelong, Carlton, the rest of the run-up into the buy is not great. Yes, he's on the round 14 buy, which is nice. Hmm. But there's a couple of guys that have the round 15 buy that you can flip to if you're still doing really well at that point that I much rather prefer, which is the top two from last year, English and Marshall. So let's talk about those two. But before we get there, there is an interesting junction that adds into this mix. Because mm. I, I agree, a lot of people will be looking to go up and drop 300,000. But there's this mm. interesting player that sits somewhere in the middle, Jordox. For starters, they've made some money. Um, Sam Darcy, uh, not Sam, sorry, Sean Darcy, has been flown mm. into Adelaide. And depending on how he trains this week, the club have said, He's every chance to play. So we'll wait for some further information that might tell people whether or not they're trading into Jackson or but trading out of Jackson. But he's this interesting mix for us too, Jordox. Before we get to English and Marshall, he throws an interesting spanner for us both for owners and non-owners for how we attack and go for this Grundy approach. Yeah, so first of all, I mean, I don't think there's any real reason to look at bringing in a Jackson, whether it's in your forward line or, you know, to cover a Grundy. I think going to the very top of the conversation about Grundy is trading him this week. Uh, the rest of your squad would be pretty, pretty tight, I think, if Grundy's a, a trade priority. He's not really hurting non-owners and he's not a problem for owners. He's just doing what he's doing. You'd be better off waiting, I, th I think, a little bit longer for an English or a Marshall to have a, a quieter game and, and jump when the price is right. Back to Jackson, though. 
you know, he offers great options for those who do want to trade out of Grundy if you've got uh, Jackson sitting in your forward line. And he was another one, kind of like the Dacos decision, albeit a, a much smaller uh, decision before the season started. When Darcy went down, I think a lot, of, all of us thought, oh, Jackson. And we went back and looked at his numbers when he was solo last year, the year before when Gorn was injured, and we just thought, this guy's going to average 100 for the first month, make you know a, a fair bit of coin, and then when Darcy's back, we'll jump off. So now we're at that point where Darcy, you know, he, I don't know, MJ, 50-50 to come back this week. Probably. If it's not this him. week, it's next. Yeah. Yeah, and they'd want him back because they're playing Port. Um, you know, Soldo's been doing a good job. So the question now is, do we jump off Jackson? And I, I'm not going to. I, it's similar to the Grundy one. I can't see how anyone doesn't have more important stuff to do this week. But I do think we'll look back at this week and say that was the week to jump off Jackson. And the question is got to be, was it the success this first four weeks? So he's added 10 points to his average. So tick. Mm -hmm. He only scored one ton out of the first four. I don't mm -hmm. think that's a tick for the expectation that this was going to be a month sure. of hundreds to, and then get out of it. So I just think it's an interesting one for those that didn't start him. They'd be thinking, yep, I, I don't think I missed out too much there. So now the yeah. question this week and, and, and how it relates to this conversation about Grundy is if you're happy to ride Jackson a little longer and have a look, and see what he can score because he averaged 86 overall with a combination of games with and without Darcy last year. So there's no reason he can't continue hitting 85 for the next little bit. That's pretty good for an R2 if you then turn your Grundy that you're jumping out of into a Flanders or whoever it is. So he offers flexibility, Jackson, but I think if you're looking, if you have Grundy and Jackson, I'd be keeping Grundy where he is at R2 and jumping off Jackson, assuming you don't have other issues. Other issues. Yeah, I, I'd probably hold at least one more week for Jackson, mm. not only regardless of Darcy this week, they have the West Coast matchup the week after that. Mm. And so for me, yeah. even with him playing a split forward ruck role in best 18s where you can be protected with basement, at worst, you undo the thirty and forty thousand dollars that you might have made, and you've banked mm. a couple of decent scores on the run through. So I, I, I I'm certainly missed the, the other side. Yeah, and, and look, it's it, I missed the West Coast fixture, obviously. That you know, as a forward, <laughs> maybe you should bring him in. Mm. But well, I guess no, what no I'm certain he just <laughs> asked Tom Papley. So um, well, that's true. But what what I'm right. getting at, MJ, is you know, and and many will know this really well. He's very been very successful in this comp. When you make a move a week before the whole competition Correct. makes that move, that's Absolutely. how you get ahead. So people who traded out James Jordan last week, they're ahead of the game. Absolutely. Yep. People who On brought him closely, <laughs> they're a little bit ahead of the game. So yep. whether it's by exactly. luck, it could, it could have been a silly thing last week, but if everyone's doing it a week later, that's smart. And I can just see a world where that's Jackson. We all want to have a look. But yep. I reckon if someone jumps off Jackson this week, it might have been, in hindsight, the right time. Yeah, not, it's a good shout. Not considering the West Coast matchup. So. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> fine. Um, so for Grundy traders, and again, there, there's a whole other variable. I don't think it's a large portion of the community, but there's a few that went the three-headed ruck monster of Cherry, mm. Grundy, and Gorn. They're a whole unique set of circumstances or well. Oh, yeah. But for those that have a Grundy trade out in their mind. You might not have the money to do it, although Jordan certainly helps. Mm. Dropping him down, getting a close, you, you should be able to do it pretty darn closely. To one of two options, Mini Monk. And so I'm going to pose you this question. If you're trading Grundy to a premium ruck, who are you going? Is it English, who's dropped under the million-dollar mark but has a break-even of 145, or are you going to Rowan Marshall, who's still over that million-dollar marker. His break-even is his average, but has had some comments from his coach saying he was pretty gassed on the weekend. We might need to bring some support his way. If we're going one of these two, who are we going and why, Benny Monk? I flagged this trade two weeks ago, I think, 
that I said right. I would be looking at three weeks ago. Was it? Wow. Grundy to Marshall three weeks ago. And that is still what I'd be doing to this day. I think everything that we've seen highlights to Marshall actually being a better AFL fantasy rock this year than Tim English. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting thing that a lot of people aren't. I don't think there's a much consensus on that in the community. The people think that it's very close between Marshall, English, and Gorn, but I'm of the opinion that Marshall has taken over the number one mantle for 2024. I agree. I think that his ability to just be dominant on the ground, there's no one going to chop out. Yes, there was comments from Ross Lyon about, oh, we might need to rest him through the year. We probably have to take those on face value and that Tom Campbell might play a game or two, but we also heard that a lot from Ross Lyon last year and we didn't see Tom Campbell once. Mm. And if we look at the next three matchups, not only who they're playing, but when they're playing, he is playing <laughs> GWS, the Western Bulldogs, and Port Adelaide, which is three out of the four green teams for ruck matchups. He mm -hmm. plays early fixtures in all three. He is a genuine vice captaincy and captaincy shout for the next three weeks. If you get onto him and you get a nailed captaincy out of at least one, if not two or three out of those weeks, you are off to the races. Oh, yes. That's why I'd be going Marshall. I agree. And I'll just, just to add to that a little bit on talking about English, I, I, there's two words for why I would, I mean, I agree with everything many just said about Marshall, but the two reasons, the two words I would use on why not to go English is Sam Darcy. Yeah. I think he's about to have, I think he's having a breakout season. I think they really like him as that second mm. up to help English. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I, I, I dare say English has just dropped a touch as Darcy has started mm. to score. He scored two out of three weeks with an 80, 80 odd. Uh, it's not the right format for him. The other two no. formats are because the pricing is much different. Um, but, you know, on top of everything Minnie said about Marshall, which I do completely agree, I think English is just going to be that, that touch off his 2023 numbers and Sam Darcy will be the reason. Yeah, a 105 is kind of where I can see Tim English being, which means in about two to three weeks' time, he's right for the picking for you if you want to make that move. If you're a cherry owner and you're trying to jump off a top-down option, he's there. If for whatever reason you are a Gorn owner and you're not happy with that, I, I don't see any reason why Gorn owners would be wanting to move off just yet. Um, but my, oh, my, yeah. English is just that touch below Marshall if I was to rank them right now. And then the break-evens and the scoring of the year would suggest that too. Have we had um, a year like this with rucks, fellas? I mean, this is the year I wish we had three rucks on field. Yeah. Yeah, you've oh. got to go back like a decade. But, yeah, they've been there. Cox, well, four Sandy, Grundy and Gorn for a while there. Um, no, nah, but, I mean, yeah. most years there's two or three. Like this year you could safely start. I'll be comfortable with you know, four or five, you know, and that'll weasel its way down yep. to maybe Gorn and Marshall. But, yeah, it's just, it's, um, you know, there are people who had Cherry at R3 to start the year. I mean, it's just yeah. maybe yeah. next year we're going to have more ruck spots. No, don't, yeah. don't give anybody ideas. <laughs> don't, don't give them ideas. <laughs> don't give anyone ideas. All right, boys, I'm going to rapid fire a couple of players to you before we wrap up this strategy roundtable. Player... You've got 15 seconds to give me your gut reactions. I'm not going to tell you who you're getting. I'll give you a 10-second premise about them, and I want you to give me your thoughts about them. We will start with you because I know there is no way Jordox is being objective about this bloke. Uh, Jake Saligo, mini mug, popped a ton for us last week, got a break even of 43. It's probably looked the best any Crows midfielder has all year, and that's not from a fantasy perspective. That's football in general. Can you trust him? And is it worth making the trade to bring him in and probably kick a cow off the ground? Potentially, but so much uncertainty. High risk, high reward, not the type of play that I'd go for. I agree with that. Uh, Jack Bowes, for you, Jordox, got bulk CBAs coming back from injury. Pretty similar price point to Saligo. Didn't have the same score, but... 
is starting to build into the year and Geelong are still a couple of weeks away from Danger and Guthrie coming back into the side. Would you say similar sentiment to Minimunk or is this one a little different? No, I think it's different. And and the fact that he's a defender eases the, the risk factor to, to a Saligo. And also the fact, you know, we talked about this in pre-season about being burnt by a player, not being scared to have another go the next year. Fife and Yo are showing us that, you know, you can have another go. And I think Bo's, you know, he had that one quarter last week where he scored just under 50 and then he backed mm. it up with four quarters as a midfielder and the cats are flying. So I, I think he's going to get a run finally. Body, um, you know, as, as long as his body stays fit, I think he'll get a run in the guts and at 550 in the back line. Yeah, I'd have a go at that. All right. Uh, speaking about that 550 marker, D'Ambrosio, the past couple of weeks, he's been a trade in option, but after basically spending the entire last quarter on the bench, just could not get back on the field. Simple question for you, Mini Monk Is it time to go or have you got other priorities? Uh, he can go if you don't have other priorities. That's a nice answer. Speaking of back lines, Jordox, Blake Howes, pretty much his break even is average. They're lining up, which is what we would say historically is time to go. But with some fixtures opening up and a buy next week, are you trusting him for one more week or are you jumping off now to those cheaper Gold Coast Suns cows? No, nah, if we didn't have those two Gold Coast, maybe you could have a conversation, but no, nah, absolutely not. Get out. Get the, All right, get fair the enough. fresh meat in. All right. Mini Monk, is Dane Zorko, a, he will be a top 10 averaging forward, but does it make it a good trade to jump into him over the next six to eight weeks? If we don't get any DPPs and he doesn't get injured, he won't just be a top 10 averaging forward. He will be a top six averaging forward. But you don't trade into someone who's got his injury history when we're in the middle of upgrade season because it can just throw you into ruin. Yep. It's very, very true. Uh, same thought, maybe not the injury history, but Jordox, a pair of really, in fact, the last three weeks really for, for Shy Bolton has been really, really nice. Very attainable break even is on the buy next week. So it's not a move for us this week. But post buy, are you telegraphing getting into Shy Bolton at around about 760, 770k as a priority? Oh, look, I'm not. I love what he's doing. And he's he's so good to watch Bolton. I think many made a really good point before about the the DPPs. You know, if we get absolutely nothing for the forwards, all of a sudden Bolton, yeah, he could be one of the top ones, but I, I just uh, I don't have the stomach for it. Some of his um, basement scores in the past are uh, just not for me, but he's a sort of guy that could take you, take you places. All right. Uh, I've got five value options before we wrap up the episode for you, and I want to get your takes on tick of whether they're targets to still look at or maybe their scoring history isn't as strong as a reason to go there. Uh, Dylan Moore. He's going to probably be under 700,000. He's given us years where he's pushed high 80s uh, before in AFL Fantasy. Mini Monk, in a week's time, maybe even two, is Dylan the guy that's going to help you get more cows off the ground for you or are you looking elsewhere? Big watch on the roll, but it's tricky with Will Day coming back soon. I'd probably pass for the time being. Yep. All right. Fair enough. Staying in the Hawthorne spot, Boris Jordox. Again, who would have thought a guy that many thought would be a top three to four defender now can barely crack an 80? That said, a lot of his poor average is due to that first round score. He's going at 90 in the past three. Probably much more bottomed out around that 760 price point, barring him hitting a ceiling game this week. You interested in James Sicily or are you, again, not really trusting his scoring? MJ... Life is already stressful enough as it is, mate. Having Sicily would just keep me up at night. Uh, look, I'll say this. If you're just playing for leagues, get him in. But because being against him when he goes big, it's just a killer. But playing for overall, no, nah, I'll just keep it simple. Not for me as well. 
maybe the other formats. Jack Sinclair, Mini Monk, dropped under 900,000 for us. Is probably at an attainable break even. Has that nice fixture that you've mentioned for us for Marshall and a good buy structure. Is now the time to jump on Jack? Or again, do we have other priorities that you'd be pushing for in our back line? I think most teams have already got three or four premiums and a mid-pricer and maybe a Nick mm -hmm. Martin or an Amon that's going to flick back there in a week or two when we get DPP. I don't think it's the time to be upgrading into premium defenders at the moment, so I'd be passing. And Jordox, does that put you know shorts in a different conversation? There's about 120,000 difference and certainly some scoring as well that's different, but similar sentiment for you, mate, that you know what, with the DPPs and the options we've already got, our midfields, our rucks and our forwards are the greater trade priority at the moment? It is. I mean, if the price is right and there's someone in the back line that could turn into a primo, then sure, you consider it. But I I don't think uh, – I, I think Jaden Short's fantasy days peaked when he was with Dimmer and I, I can't see him get back to those heights. Still a great player and, you know, um, ha very handy in drafts and whatnot, but I just don't see it in fantasy now. Yeah, trading into a premium defender or, or any defender that's not value, as in a cash cow moneymaker, you are focusing on the wrong end of the ground um, would be my suggestion. And then lastly, Mini Monk, I had to throw one of your boys to you. Uh, going at oh. 110, hitting an interesting <laughs> break even. Um, we're starting to look at some cheap midfielders and like you've mentioned we're about to roll back the roberts the amon the bonners the mccurches into our back lines and we can start to look at the marty Hoare, the williams a bunch of different options we can look at attaining them as upgrade pathways to a premium mid is andrew brayshaw someone you're looking at no oh talk to me not even a squint not even a squint. He okay. is the third banana in that midfield now. He is behind Sarong and Young for CBA percentages. And the fixture and the price is just not there and just not low enough for me to go for him. All right. But it's coming from a Freo man. So that's Yeah, good. I know. Yeah, we, we were both pretty bullish on him in the preseason, but proof is in the pudding now that if he gets to 900K, I'll listen. Um, yeah, well, he's still, we're not talking uh, about him he's still sitting at 110 average. I mean, he's, you know. He is oh, still sitting at 110 I, average, but he's also priced at 110. Yeah, correct. True. And when uh, you're I'd, in upgrade I'd, season. I'd be tempted. Yeah. I'll be tempted, but I'll keep Mini Monk's voice in my ear. Yeah, no, it's always it's always well to do that. Hey, lads, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on this episode. Jordox, nice to have you back on the pod, and uh, we might see you a little bit more from time to time during the AFL Fantasy Roundtable season proper. Thanks, mate. Thanks, guys, for having me. It's been good fun. And uh, Mini Monk, I'm going to call you back in 24 hours. We're going to double up and do super coach <laughs> duty as well, all right, mate? So rest up. You've got 24 hours, uh, and then we're going to jump into another strategy roundtable with the other format. Uh, as always, mate, some great work from you. Cheers, and you're just wanting everything out of my brain in the in this this week, hey? Yep, just absolutely. Every, you know, just, every just week. farming it. Every week. Every, every week. week. Every week every as week. the community, we're farming minds, uh, wisdom out of you. Hey, thank you so much. If you've watched this on YouTube, uh, let us know what your trade plans are below as a comment. We'd love to know. We'll make sure we answer those trade dilemmas that you've got. If you haven't subscribed or shared the videos in your AFL fantasy circles, it's not too late. Make sure you do that. If you're listening to this as an audio podcast, thank you for listening. If you haven't subscribed, from wherever you listen to this podcast, jump in. It's not too late. Make sure you do that and give a five star rating it helps others that are looking for afl fantasy content in their podcast ecosystem be able to find the coaches panel if they haven't already done so and then of course to our loyal and new patrons we are only able to do what we do every single week whether it be the podcast the videos social media and a bunch of other stuff that happens exclusively for you we exist uh, for everybody to listen to but it's because of patreons like you that financially support us whether you want to jump in at that breakout that premium or that cash count here there are great rewards available at every single level and we'd certainly encourage you to get involved in that with all the details in the description of this episode. Good luck this week. Back into best 18. 
no Collingwood and no Swans. And as Mini Monk has declared, it is upgrade season. So we can all jump in to officially hitting upgrade mode. Good luck this week and I hope everything goes your way.